That being said, I also want to welcome you. It's neat to see some of the some of the pews starting to fill in a little bit. I'm grateful that you're here. I hope you're glad that you're in this place this morning. Um, I just want to start uh, by way of introduction. Just uh, kind of start with uh, how many how many of you have a weak stomach in some area? Any of you have any kind of a weak stomach in in any particular area? Well, uh, you're going to get a chance to hear from each other because I don't think that necessarily the greeting time got deep enough. And so I want you to turn to each other and just ask them, what makes you vomit? (laughs) Okay, would you just kind of share that among yourselves for just a minute? You know, just, what makes you vomit? Okay, that should be a real greeting time kind of conversation, right? Um... Don't get, go too overboard. Please don't show them. Uh, some people get sick to their stomach because you start talking about being sick to your stomach. So let's, let's be very careful about that. But, you know, some of the things, if, if you took any time, if you really played with, along with me this morning, there's all kinds of stuff. Food poisoning, of course, is a uh, good one. Um, for some, it's just baby diapers. Uh, I had a buddy who uh, had a buddy and his wife had gone to the, to the city to... Uh, to uh, be away, and he swore he would take care of the little one, uh, still in diapers, and the child had an explosion, and uh, uh, he actually had to call the neighbor. He was so sick to his stomach that he had to call the neighbor to come over and, and take care, because he just couldn't go near that, and the wife was so embarrassed about it. He, she was even more embarrassed the next time, because when she, the same, a similar thing happened, she just took the, he just took the kid out in the, in the front yard and hosed him down. And uh, that was as, as well as he could take it. I don't know about you. Uh, you know, I, I've heard people say, well, you know, a really fresh roadkill gets to me sometimes. Others of you, I realize, just pack it out and take it home. But uh, the, for, for, uh, for a lot of people, me, it's coconut. I have a story that, you know, I'll tell you about sometime, but not this morning. Many of us, it's just a matter of some type of a rotten smell will start to create the involuntary contractions in the in the throat and everything i have a story about a forgotten box of hamburger patties that i left in our van for two weeks and the i I, to be honest i'm not the reason i'm not telling it is because i just that's that starts with me just even thinking about it and so i i uh i don't even tell then i got to thinking how do i want to kick this off uh i i thought about maybe googling Things that make people vomit and getting some pictures. And so I thought I would just put them up in no particular order, but I really couldn't do that. (laughs) So instead, I just want you to picture a squirrel, okay? And uh, that squirrel is going to be your your connection with the introduction this morning. We'll call him Chuck, uh, short for Up Chuck. And uh, that'll, you know, that's as best as I was going to do. if you're new to the fellowship this morning, you're going to, what in the world is that guy all about? And I hope you're going to understand in just a minute, because um, in, and in preparation for that, thanks for, thanks for being a part of this, and, and uh, hopefully maybe it'll be a little more memorable. What you do need to know, if you forget the rest of this, you need to know that we're in a series that is asking the question, are you a Christian atheist? And uh, if you haven't been here in the first couple of weeks of this four-part series, you, uh, you may be asking a, a very pertinent question. What is a Christian atheist? And uh, you, you may know what an atheist is. An atheist is somebody who doesn't believe that God exists, and therefore they're probably not living as if God exists. But what about this idea of a Christian atheist? I heard the term first used by a guy by the name of Craig Rochelle out of Tulsa, Oklahoma preacher and has written a lot of books, but uh, the definition is this. A Christian atheist is someone who believes in God, but is living as if God doesn't exist. And so we've been trying to come up with some some examples or some characteristics of a Christian atheist, and it's a four-part series. We could probably go on and on and on, but for the the sake of this particular uh, month, we're just going through a four-part series. Um, Week one, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the idea that a Christian atheist is someone who believes in God, but really doesn't know him, or at least doesn't know him well. That's probably 90% of the people in the United States. 
They're these cultural Christians. They, they think they're Christians because they, they're Americans. Or they think they're Christians because they don't kick their dog, or they don't smoke and they don't chew and they don't go with girls that do. And that's their definition. And cultural Christianity was what we kind of talked about the first week. Last week was week two, and we talked about the, the, the time and the experience of those who believe, but really don't have a reverent fear of God. In other words, they, they almost customize Christianity. You take your Bible, and I really like some of these passages that talk about how much God loves me and how he takes care of me and everything. I really don't like that passage that talks about taking up the cross and following him and all that. And so it's customized. And in a sense, the reason being, you really don't realize God is all that he is. And the, the sense of, of awe and reverence that we ought to have toward him as the great God of the universe. And all of our messages are on our YouTube channel if you want to catch any of them. And, and uh, that, th those two are the same way. The last topic in our series is going to be a topic, that, a, a series that we look at right before Praise in the Park, the end of the month. And it's talking about a uh, Christian atheist who believes in God but doesn't really trust him fully. For all areas of their life. There are some areas where we're just not giving it over because I'm not sure what God's going to do with it. And, and so we're, we're going to be talking about that in just a couple of weeks. But today's message, I have to admit, and I appreciate the guys that came in with me at 9 to, to pray for this morning's message because they were right as they prayed that, that it looks like this may be kind of a hard-hitting kind of a, uh, of a message because we're talking about those people some of whom are gathered here in this place, and all of us at one time or another in different areas of our life have fallen to the, to the scheme of the devil that uh, uh, we, we believe in God, but we just don't want to go overboard in this belief. We, we, we really want to be what you would call, we talked about cultural and customized Christianity, this would be the, the um, comfortable Christianity. We, we, want to be, we want to be a Christian. We just don't want to be like those Christians. The ones that are fanatical, the ones that are all into it, the ones that are crazy about Jesus' teachings, and, and, and they, they would be called the freaks. Now, I, I don't want to take it too far. And yet, it's this message that even if you want to throw away the first seven minutes of this conversation about what makes you vomit... Um, this message is of prime importance, and while it may have been fun and interesting and maybe give you something to talk about the crazy preacher when you go home for lunch today or something, I, I would just want you to know that the Bible tells us about what makes Jesus vomit, what makes Jesus sick to his stomach, what just repulses him. And the answer is found in the book of Revelation. So I want you to grab a Bible. If you don't have it there, take it off your Bible uh, app uh, that you've got in your, uh, in your hand right now, texting anyway. Go to your Bible act, app at this point. And uh, most of us, when we think of the book of Revelation, we think of it as being a, a picture of the end times. We, we figure it's all about prophecy and it's all about uh, end time imagery. But in the early chapters of Revelation, John... The author, the Apostle John, is told by a risen Christ, this was in about 90 A.D., 60-some years after Christ had ascended into heaven, he is told by this risen Christ a, a, a series of, of informational letters, in a series of informational letters, he is told of some things he's supposed to communicate to seven churches that were in existence at the end of the first century A.D., and one after another, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we have these letters to seven different churches. And to six of the churches, Jesus writes this letter, or has John compose, or write this letter at his instruction. He's, he sends both commendations to the church, good, things they're doing well, and also corrections. Things that they need to change, things they, need to do, they should be doing that they're not doing, or not doing what they should be doing. And we're going to look at that one church. Six of the churches, corrections and, and commendations. One church, he has nothing good to say about this church. He goes right to the correction. It's a whole letter that tell, tells us what this church was doing wrong. It's the church at Laodicea. Okay? 
Now, as we look at these few verses that are listed in your outline, that, let me give you a little background. It's this particular city and this, the church that represents God in this city. It's in modern-day Turkey, modern-day Turkey, and it's a very wealthy city. So wealthy that history tells us that 35 years before Jesus has John write about it, um, this city was destroyed by a massive earthquake. But because the city and the area was so wealthy, they quickly rebuilt everything bigger and better than it already was. So that by the time that, that Paul, that, excuse me, that John is writing about it, this is a this is a city that is known for its theaters for the, for the arts. It's known for its stadiums for the athletic events. It's known for the, the marketplaces, almost like malls. They, it, it, they're known for the public baths and the opportunities of, of uh, recreation and, and leisure. And this layout of city, city is right in the middle of Turkey, more or less, out in the middle of nowhere. So it's kind of like Las Vegas. Have you ever driven down I-15? And you, you, it is like you are crossing the surface of the moon. I mean, it is, it is a moon landscape. It is isolated. It is desolate. And you come over that rise, and goodness sakes, there is civilization like you see no place else. And, and there it is. Well, if you can get that picture of Las Vegas, next, that's the picture, yeah. If you can get that picture, that's kind of what Laodicea would have been like. Travelers on these different uh, on these different trade routes would look forward to arriving in Laodicea because it was a great break from everything they'd been experiencing. And and during the first century of the gospel spreading, Laodicea was the kind of city that we sometimes equate with uh, with in the United States with Las Vegas. Some of you have traveled the world of uh, cities like Dubai that are right there in the in the desert and just just. But anyway, just understand, they were impossibly wealthy almost. They had everything you could imagine. They wanted anything they wanted to live on, they could get it there in town. And understand that Jesus is writing not to the city of Laodicea. He is writing to the church who is supposed to be representing him in the city of Laodicea. And he says in Revelation 3, verse 15, and this is where we're going to be for the rest of the morning between here and verse 20, Jesus says, I know your deeds. You are neither hot nor cold, and I wish you were either one or the other, but because you are, and here's the word in the morning, because you are lukewarm, which means neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, remember, he's talking about a church. He's not talking about the community. And he says of this church and the leadership and the membership of this church, I know your deeds. He doesn't say, I know what you stand for. I know what you say you believe. I see how you're living, and I wonder whether you really believe it. Because he says in, in, in Revelation here, that what we've been saying in the, this entire series, that how we live reflects the true reality of what we believe. And look at how they lived. He says, I wish, I wish that you were either hot or cold. I wish you were one or the other. You're neither one. Uh, most of us are drinkers of hot and cold beverages. Uh, iced coffee, not bad. Hot coffee, really good for a lot of us. Uh, let your coffee sit out for about four hours. And you pick it up expecting one or the other. And I started to, t to do that visually, but you guys sat on the front rows, so I'm not going to do it. But you know what, you know, just spew, you know, just spew it. Same thing is true with hot tea or iced tea. Same thing is true with hot chocolate or cho cold, ice cold chocolate milk. It, all of those things, they get tepid, they get lukewarm, and we're not really that excited about participating in, their, in, in drinking them. Well, this, this had a very special uh, picture to the people and to the church at Laodicea, simply because this city of Laodicea, out in the middle of nowhere, what he's talking about here had a very special significance in the city's operation. Because for all their wealth, they didn't really have a water supply, except that there, there was a natural rock cauldron underground on, on outside the city, city that had 
very cold underground spring-fed water. And there was also, on the similar side of the city, a hot springs. And the rich people who could afford to do it, and the city fathers who could afford to do it because of all the wealth of the city, they ran an aqueduct from the cistern for cold water. They ran an aqueduct from the hot springs for hot water. And the rich people in town built all their homes close to the start of that aqueduct system. At every so often, there would be connectors that would go out into the different neighborhoods where they could collect water. And the rich people lived real close to the source. And when they were close to the source, they got their hot water hot, and they got their cold water cold. And the poorer people, farther away they got from the source, by the time the water got to them, it was tepid. It was lukewarm. And so they understood this very, very completely. And so when, when Jesus... When they read the words of Jesus, it says, So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. They understood. There, there had been their, they had had their experiences with the hot and cold water. Running water, but increasingly more tepid the further down the line it got. And Jesus says, because you're, you're lukewarm, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. Now, here's where my gross introduction came from. Because here, in this verse, is the answer to what makes Jesus vomit. Because while most of your translations euphemistically translates it as spit out, it is a Greek word, the word emo that's only used once in the whole Bible, right here, in this particular verse, and it means to vomit. It means to gag and retch and hurl and spew and as a result, over time, it came to mean and to refer to someone's utter rejection of something. Someone being completely repulsed by something they were seeing or experiencing. It's kind of like eating an egg salad sandwich with rotten hard-boiled eggs and mayonnaise that have been sitting out for a week and a half. You know, that, it, it may look good on the plate, may look good on the bread, uh, but that, as the faces you're making and whatever is coming up in your throat because we're talking about it, that is really in some ways characterizing this word that Jesus uses to its fullest meaning. Because if you do that, ask any nurse, if you do that, your body begins to reject it in as many possible ways as it can. And that's part of it. Now, I, I, I guess I apologize, but I want to deal with this verse this morning in the, in the most graphic, the most come-to-life kind of opportunity, simply because it's Jesus talking. And what Jesus is saying is, here is, believer, when you don't have any passion about your faith, when you are apathetic and you are complacent and you are just content to be comfortable in your religious experience, he says, I can't stomach that. I'm rejected. I, mean, I reject it and I am repulsed by you even considering that you are a follower of mine with such a, such a lukewarm approach to what is of, of major importance or should be of major importance in your life. Now, this particular passage has given rise to that oxymoron of lukewarm Christian. You know what, a, uh, uh, what an oxymoron is? You know, it's like um, tight slacks or um, government efficiency or uh, jumbo shrimp, okay, Microsoft works. Uh, you know, uh, <laughs> there's a bunch of them, but, but th this one here, lukewarm Christian, may be the, one of the greatest oxymorons because here is Jesus calling, just because you call yourself a follower of Christ, but you're not on fire about it. A lukewarm follower of Jesus, a lukewarm disciple of Christ, a lukewarm Christian, you got some problems. Now, before you start looking up and down the rows and seeing who this applies to, this morning, uh, 
Consider you don't go much further than yourself, because that's what makes this morning a hard-hitting message. I've already had to filter it through my own issues, but uh, we're not going to be talking about other people this morning. We're going to be talking about you and me. And in understanding that when, when Jesus is repulsed and his revulsion of, a, of a, any time we have a look, lukewarm approach to our faith, uh, there may be some issues that we need to deal with even this morning. So I'm going to go through a real quick self-survey. Uh, some di- it's kind of a self-examination, then I'm going to make a real quick, uh, um, real quick application. I think if we got together and got our heads together, we probably could come up with maybe 70 different things that uh, are qualities in terms of uh, what, what, what do you do, you know, what does that lukewarm Christian look like? But uh, I want us to understand that we're, we're dealing with a very serious illness this morning. We're dealing with an illness of relationship, and that illness of relationship is the relationship between you and me and Jesus Christ. And yes, it may be very easy for us to see other people's problems in this particular area. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says you can see the speck in your, in your brother's eye, but you can't see the log in your own eye. That's, that's kind of what we're talking about this morning. But this morning... There are some areas that we need to see in ourselves. And I could have just listed them, but I thought maybe I could get your attention by just asking the question, do you make Jesus sick? Do you make Jesus sick? And there's a connection, because the truth is, if you are lukewarm, Jesus is sickened by your approach to his, to his grace and his mercy. So we're going to go through some of this this kind of self-study. We're going to look at some scriptures. And all the while, what we're going to be looking at is the qualities of a lukewarm approach to faith that sickens Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. First one is, do you crave the acceptance from people more than the acceptance from God? This could almost be a Jeff Foxworthy skit. You might be a lukewarm Christian. Okay? If you crave the acceptance for people more than the the acceptance from God, you might be a lukewarm Christian. Paul tells Timothy in his second letter the fact that in the last days, there are going to be people who are lovers of themselves. And I'm telling you right now, if you don't have to be, if you can't see it for yourself, we live in a very self-centered, some would say a selfie-centered generation. I mean, that, that, it's all about, do you like me? Do you approve of me? Do you like what I'm wearing? Do you like what I'm eating? Do you like what I'm doing? Uh, oh, why did you unfriend me? Why don't you like me? Why? Uh, I'll conform if you just like me. I'll conform my likes to your likes. I'll conform my morals to your morals. I just want you to love me. I just want you to accept me. I would. We crave the acceptance. And yet, Jesus warns in Luke 6 that we better be careful. We need to beware if Everybody is saying good things about us. And yet most of us are craving and are living for the approval of people rather than, the, than living from the approval of God. To know that God approves us, and I don't care what the rest of you think. Crave acceptance from people more than the acceptance of God. Lukewarm, if that's an indicator of your life and approach. Then I want to ask you number two. Do you rarely share your faith in Jesus Christ? If so, you may be a lukewarm Christian. In other words, there's this goodness of God that you and I have found in Jesus Christ, and if you know it, are you sharing that goodness with others? And if not, why not? We have a lot of answers. I don't want to be looked at as weird. I don't want to... I, I, I don't want to reject somebody and have them feel like I'm, I'm offending them or putting them down. I don't want to get into an argument with somebody. But very often the truth of, of and the, what is it, the heart of our decision not to share is really the fact that uh, we don't believe that the power of God transforms lives. And we can't stand with Paul when he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God to salvation for all who believe. 
Because if we really believe that, that the, that the word and the gospel is the power of God to salvation for all who believe, we would get over our fears. And we would pray daily that God would show us ways to share with those who haven't yet discovered so that others could have the same fullness of life that we have discovered in Jesus Christ. Jesus makes it clear, if you don't acknowledge him before men, he won't acknowledge you and me before his Father who is in heaven. This is a vital expression of a believer sold out on fire for Christ. But lukewarm Christians don't, in fact, rarely share their faith. Third question to ask yourselves, do you rationalize sin in your life? See, we live in a day where people are really good at rebranding and renaming sin all the time. John, in 1 John, he, he, he writes to, to the churches, uh, churches that he loves. He says, you've got to be careful. If you say that we don't sin, we are calling God a liar and his word, which talks about our need for a savior because of sin in our life, is not in us. And while we may not completely reject it, one way that we can, can say that we don't sin is to not call it sin. Invent fancy names. Instead of sin, we talk about my human frailty. We talk about the bad tendencies that I learned from my home growing up. The, the weaknesses that I have. And then we take the individual sins and we euphemize them. Things like adultery is now what? An affair. Pornography is adult entertainment. That sounds so much better. Profanity is adult language. You're only 12. Don't talk like that. Wait until you're 20. And then we look at the way people are acting and, and compare them to our us and we say, well, I'm not as bad as they are in this area or that area. And so, as a result, we still rebrand or rename sin, don't we? we? It depends on whether we're talking about sin in us or sin in somebody else. Sin in others, they're prejudiced. Me, I've got convictions. Others, they're conceited. Me, I just have a strong, good self-esteem. Some are lazy and won't step up and, and, won't, and are selfish when it comes to doing anything in the church. They're, they're all that. Me? Well, I just can't because I'm pretty busy right now. You see, with others, it's, it's anger. With us, it's righteous indignation. It just goes on and on and on. We rationalize, and what happens when we rationalize is we never deal with the poison that it really is. And then we never realize the depths that Jesus had to go to to become for sin for us. And because we don't do that, we go around crippled because the power of his resurrection is not touching the sickness. And if anybody dares talk about it, then we either say, well, it's no big deal, i got a handle on it, or it's none of your business. Then let's move quickly. I'm starting to step on toes. I can't do that. Let's move on to number four. Do you think that if, if you think more about life on earth than about eternity in heaven, you may be a lukewarm Christian. If you're more consumed with things on earth than heavenly things, that may be the case. You see, Paul says something very, very crazy, really, when you think about it, at this point in Philippians, where he says, for me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. Do you understand what he's saying? Paul's approach to that, he says, for me, to be on this earth is just one more day to represent Christ. And while I'm here, that's what I'm going to do. But if I die, I get to go to heaven. That's way better. And yet we see on earth people holding on to their life. I see it among professing Christians. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. Why? I don't want to die. That's about the extent and end of it. They're so consumed with, with the earth and all the things of this world... And, and the determination to get more and more and more. Just in love with the things of the earth instead of in love with the God who created it all. It's a lukewarm Christian 
who thinks more about life on earth than eternity in heaven. Number five, you might be a lukewarm Christian if you uh, only turn to God when you need something. Now, it's good that you know where to turn when you need something. We all need God. But the problem is sometimes when things are going the best, it's a who needs God. The weather's great. The kids are healthy. They've got money to pay the bills. Everybody, uh, and our focus goes somewhere else. But then all of a sudden, cancer hits. And we pull God out of the toolbox. And we say, I need you. And, and God in his grace, okay. The chemo worked. I don't need you anymore, God. Back in the box. Things are going good, and then all of a sudden the kids have trouble. Uh, I need you again, God. Believe in God, but we usually use him for our benefit. Why? Because we're not in that daily relationship with him. You might be a lukewarm Christian if you're calling on God only when you need him. Number six talks about another characteristic. I, and I would ask you, do you only give when it's convenient? Oh, Marty, you weren't going to go there, were you? I'll give when it's popular. I'll give if it's an opportunity for me to look good. I'll give if it doesn't infringe upon my standard of living. If I feel like it, Marty, just don't push me in that. It's my stuff. It's my money. It's mine, 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 mine. The committed follower of Jesus Christ understands that it's God's. 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 And the lukewarm are the ones that don't want to talk about it. And that it's none of your business, church. One more question, it doesn't fit in the same form as the other six, but in some ways it is kind of the general assessment that's based on the other six uh, questions. And that's the question, you might be a lukewarm Christian if you're not much different than the rest of the world. You see, the lukewarm Christian watches the same movies and the TV shows and laughs at some of the same off-color and lewd jokes. I had somebody say to me the other day, uh, I commented on a movie I thought I wanted to see. No, Marty, you, want to, you don't want to see it. We laughed our heads off, but you won't like it. Lewd, crude, humor is everybody else. Same music, same language. Language in the workplace, language on the golf course, language at the parties. Conducting ourselves in the same way, same morals, same, in, same goals for our kids. Divorce happening just as often. We talked in recent weeks about culture of Christianity, customized Christianity. This is the comfortable Christianity today. We want what God has for me, but I don't want, it, I don't want to have to follow him in what he wants me to do and what he wants me to be. I want just enough of Jesus to get into heaven and to keep me out of hell, but not so much that I become one of those fanatics about my faith. I don't call you this. Jesus calls you this. You're lukewarm. And the sad thing is that without every one of us doing a very gut check, real personal assessment, we may not see it. The church at Laodicea didn't see it. Jesus describes their condition in verse 17 and by starting with what is their faulty vision of themselves. Jesus says, you say, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need anything. But you don't realize that you are wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked. And Jesus is saying that not just to make an observation of the church life. He's saying it to, to, for them to understand very clearly why he is repulsed by their deeds. You just need to know that I'm talking about these issues this morning. Because I've had those times in le lukewarm Christian living. And it wasn't before I was a preacher. It's been since I was a preacher. When I first had the opportunity to go to the pulpit, I was on fire about the possibility. But over time, I became the thing that I joke about all the time, that professional Christian. The one that reads his Bible, but just in, in order to prepare for sermons or to prepare for Bible studies. The one who, uh, the one who prays. In fact, I think there may have been times when I prayed more in public than I did in private, and I didn't give. Didn't give to the full, full extent simply because I felt like my sacrifice in ministry made my salary level at, and my low salary level 
my, the difference between what I was worth and what I was being paid was my tithe. And what happened was what I read another preacher acknowledged this week. I let my ministry work destroy Christ's work in me. And it was before I came here, the period, if you're trying to figure out what year in these 15, okay, it was before I came. But I realized in a period of reflection, and I really believe it's God that showed it to me, that he said, Marty, you've become a full-time preacher, but you've become a part-time Christian. you become a part-time follower of Christ. Now, I know not many of you in here, in fact, nobody that I'm aware of is a, is a full-time vocational preacher, pastor like myself, but... I, I, I wanna, I've left the application of this morning to kind of be a tie together of all seven questions and maybe a restate of question number seven because I want you to ask a question yourself. Are you a full-time and fill in the blank? Are you a full-time mom, business person, oil field worker, full-time student, whatever you want to put in there? Are you full-time there but are you a part-time follower of Jesus? You see, the tragedy is, that's where so many who are sitting in churches today would, would have to acknowledge they are. And it's really not hard in America to understand why. It's easy to be a Christian in America. It's easy, it's almost expected. And as a result, it may be, that's maybe why it's so hard to be a true follower of Christ. Most of you are aware, and some of you have visited the places in our world where it is costly to name Jesus as Christ. It is costly to gather with other believers to own a Bible. And you know what, what you don't find in those countries? Lukewarm Christians. You don't find lukewarm Christians there. Only authentic ones, because if you are a follower of Christ, it's going to cost you. It could cost you your job, your reputation, your head. And what is happening in other Parts of our world where, where persecution is, is strong, it's become a blessing. Because the church and individual believers have become stronger. And I would just warn you, as we've warned frequently in this, this past spring of the year, that the tide is turning here. And people are pushing back. And government is pushing back. And it's becoming more discriminating. Even you might consider the first signs of persecution in this one nation under God. And it may result, may have already resulted for some of you in job loss and, and restrictions. And you're going to have to, you're going to be forced to decide, am I in or am I out? Because the line is being more and more clearly drawn and the lukewarm are going to step away from that line and the committed are going to step over now i believe that if you realize what jesus has done for you you can't be lukewarm and as a result i believe that the true church is going to be strengthened in the years ahead and differences suddenly will not be the battlegrounds between christians that they are today. We're eventually going to appreciate the way it is in, in third world countries where you are so excited to find another believer in Jesus Christ and have, realize how much you need them that the petty differences are going to be set aside. People are going to take their stand and get all in or they're going to decide, no, that's not for me. That's just going a little too far. And I would just ask you, what are you going to say when you're asked, do you believe? Are you fully devoted to the one who gave your life, his life for you? See, this Laodicea culture is very similar to the one that we're in today. We're, we're all about wealth, worldly wealth, theaters, shopping centers, stadiums, entertainment. We've got so much. But notice how they respond. How, how, how much they feel like they need God because they had it all. Verse 17 again says very simply, I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. I don't need anything. What he says posed a new question for me this week. And I'm, I'm probably going to preach it another time. But is Jesus really talking to Christians at this point? 
It doesn't say that anywhere. Notice we have added the word Christian in there, lukewarm Christians. He really isn't even suggesting that they are followers of his. They're a part of the church, but they're not necessarily followers of his. I mean, how often does Jesus call his followers wretched and pitiful and poor and blind and naked? If that hits you right now, the way it's hitting me, it hit me this week, then God may be right now doing something that he does very often, and he may, hopefully he's doing it very lovingly. But I hope he's convicting a lot of you in here this morning. Some of you are th- who are suddenly realizing, yeah, I believe in God, but I don't really know him, and I don't know him because I'm not fully committed to him. What if that's you? What if that's you this morning? Let me offer the challenge. And the challenge comes from the words of Jesus Christ. Jump down a couple of verses in verse 20. Because Jesus, to this, this wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, naked nation, uh, church, he extends the most amazing invitation. He says, here I am. I stand at the door and I knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with that person and they will eat with me. So what do you do this morning if you realize you're not all in? And you know you should be all in and you want to be all in. This verse tells you what to do. Open the door of your heart and say, Jesus, come in. Admit I've kept you on the outside. You are God the Son. You are Savior of all, uh, of the world. You are Lord of all. And, and this morning, Lord, come in. Come in. Come in to stay. I give you full ownership. And I surrender every single corner of my life to you. That's the challenge. That you would recognize who's on the outside and you would let him in. Verse 20, I, I, and I know how familiar it is, and I don't want the familiarity for, to have you and cause you to miss it. Look at it this morning with fresh eyes, if you would. He says, here I am, I stand at the door, and I knock. I'm here. And if you would just open up, anyone, and you would hear my voice. Well, what's he saying, Marty? What's he saying? He's saying stuff like, I love you. He's saying, I want, you, I want to come in. I gave my life for you. But you're going to have to open the door and know that I will come in and eat with you and become the host and you'll be eating with me. The thing here is, you don't have to clean house. You ever had those times when you look out the window, oh, it's such and such, and you start throwing stuff away and over the, over the back of the chair and everything so it looks all clean and straight. It's still a mess, but it's just in different places. You don't have to do that with him. You don't have to get your life all perfect first. You just let him come in. Jesus, come in. And that's what he does, just as you are. He loves you. And he wants to do what he came to do, to accept you. But the neat thing is he doesn't just leave you there in the mess that is your your life. He transforms and he forgives sin and you're no longer As you were, you're a new creation in Christ. And the old is gone and the new has come. And there are those of you this morning who need to open up your ears. I so appreciate Ricky's sermon while he was gone. How he pleaded. I don't plead enough, but I realize from Ricky's comments, I've got to plead with you more. That's part of my responsibility. My plea to you this morning is to hear Jesus' voice. Hear his voice and let him in because he's knocking. A picture that's up on the screen is a really familiar picture, and I put it up there to make it one point in closing. Not that that's what Jesus looks like. But I think what, what the reason it's up there is because if you look carefully at the door, that door of your heart, that picture of Revelation 3.20, the one thing you don't see on the door is a doorknob. You don't see a handle. You don't see any way in which Jesus can come in if he is not invited. As King of kings and Lord of lords, he can bust right through that door, but he's a gentleman. And he will not come unless he's invited. And some of you need to open that door this morning. Others of you may say, yeah, I've done that. But the truth is, I've gotten comfortable. 
in my life, and I've gotten complacent, so, so what do I do then? Well, we just had our, some of our grandkids with us the last couple of days, and it was a nice, uh, just a nice kind of diversion, realizing I couldn't be at the funeral, but had my grandkids, and, and I thought back on uh, my kids, who are now very grown, uh, but there was a time when they were each one very little, and, and there were times when I would pull the car into the drive, and I'm sure Diane said, Dad's home. And my little, little ones. Now, they got older, they just laid there and read the book. and yeah, you know. But with the little ones, they would go running to the door and throw the door open and jump in my arms. And we would have some of the neatest snuggle times. In the same way, like a little child, you need to realize that Jesus is still there. And all you have to do is run to him this morning. Pursue him right now and just tell him afresh, I want to be with you. I want to be close to you. I need you. Because you need to know that he has not left you. That's a super picture. And it's reflective of what you may need to do today. To realize that it's Jesus, King of kings and Lord and Lord, the only Savior, the one only name under heaven by which we can be saved, He's the one on the outside knocking and wanting to come in. My prayer for you today is a prayer, I hopefully, a prayer with you today that you would do that for the sake of your eternal future. Would you pray with me? Oh, oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name. strength is failing the end draws near and my time has come still my soul will sing your praise unending ten thousand years and then Ending. Let's uh, let's be dismissed. Just a couple of quick reminders. Uh, if you want to continue in fellowship and just greeting each other in the name of the Lord, our fellowship location this Lord's Day is over at Wendy's. So if you want to head there, uh, we will uh, look forward to uh, continuing in the fellowship. A couple of bits of information. Just need to know that they are, we already know that there are baptisms the next couple of Sundays. If, if you would like to participate in that, if you'd like to uh, go on in your obedience to Christ your identity in his death, burial, and resurrection. See myself or one of the leadership. We'll make plans for your baptism one of the next two weeks. Also, just know exciting things are ahead as it relates to uh, Praise in the Park on the 30th, where we'll be together with the other congregations of, uh, of Vernal and uh, having a special time of worship. Some of our uh, praise team will be with others from the other four con- three congregations, and uh, you are asked to bring desserts for the part of the potluck barbecue that immediately follows. Um, Also, we finally have a sign-up sheet out in the foyer. If you are interested in being kept apprised of your own mission trip to Austria, to work at uh, House Edelweiss, where Diane and I were earlier this summer and had an opportunity to talk about it the first of the summer, if you're not quite ready for Cambodia, then maybe Austria is your first step. Uh, baby steps, we'll give it to you if you need it, but uh, we're going to Austria probably in the spring of 2017, but uh, we can take 10 if, you, if you're at all interested in being kept advised of what that's all about. 
uh, sign up in the foyer and we'll uh, keep you aware of what's ahead in, in that regard as well. Otherwise, just thank you so much for being here. Join me in prayer and you'll be dismissed. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to worship. Thank you that you bless our souls through your, your constant intervention in our lives and just showing us what you're doing and inviting us to join you. You do it in the streets where we live. You do it in the cities where we live. You do it in countries that we would never visit except for the fact that you've broken our hearts for what breaks yours. And Father, in each and every case, we discover a blessing. We discover that in the ugliest of places, you are bringing beauty. You are making beautiful out of the destruction of others uh, who are in their sin, destroying your precious creation. Father, that's happening around this world. We thank you for just the reminder that we can be your hands and feet. And Father, my prayer is that as we go from this place, that which we will experience will be a richer and a fuller realization of what you're calling us to, and that we might in turn just say we're in, and we step over the line, and we go forth with so, as souls on fire. We pray it in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless. Thank you for coming.